Liverpool, England, not just famous for its music and its landmarks, but also famous for its shipyard, Camel Lairds. This site in Birkenhead was a world beater, making vessels that have graced every stretch of water in the world. And it was these cranes that helped pave the way to a golden age of British shipbuilding. But those days are over. These dinosaur-like reminders are about to get a bolt of comet-sized proportions. Expert explosive engineers, the Control Demolition Group, are on site. Mick Williams and Dick Green have joined forces with Phil Lowe and Holly Bennett, and they're about to be tested to the limit. Five days, three cranes, one mission. Bring them all down. It's a job that will see them battling gale force winds. An unrelenting deadline. Um, behind, as we've been all the way through. A steel demolition with potentially fatal consequences. Oh, come on! Five minutes! And even a newborn baby. Is it all right if I go? Baby's coming. There's truly no such thing as an ordinary day in demolition. Great Britain's seafaring history owes a great debt, not only to the cranes, but the whole Camel Laird site. Originally established in 1824, at its peak, the yard employed 12,000 people, and without them, Britain's Polaris nuclear submarines and naval ships like the Ark Royal would never have ruled the waves. But by the mid-80s, the industry was in decline, and in 1993, the yard was closed down, but not quite out. The job will be like going 10 rounds with three heavyweight boxes. Weighing in at 1,000 tons each, there's no doubt they can certainly back a punch. And standing 80 meters tall, they'll be a formidable opponent that'll be hard to knock out. To plot the crane's downfall, the team will have to weaken them by punching their way through the soft midsection at the front of each one. Explosives are then placed on each front leg. When they blow, the momentum should propel the cranes forward to safety. Here's the checklist. Give it a few jabs to the midriff. Pinpoint the weak spots. Tie it in knots. Duck and dive. Apply the sucker punch. That's the plan, but would it work? Day one sees Holly Bennett and Phil Lowe discussing tactics. So we've got 38 year old Phil has only been with controlled demolition for about two years, but has a wealth of explosive knowledge behind him while Holly started on site aged 18. She's now one of only three women in the world qualified as an explosives engineer. When I first started, I used to just go to blowdowns on a weekend, eventually sort of built up a little bit more. Six years later, I'm still here, unfortunately. It's very cold in winter, horrible, in fact, but summer's fantastic. The key challenge of the early stages is to knock out the middle sections at the front of each crane. At the moment, what they're doing on this crane here is just taking out the non-structural steel work um, so that we can get in um, to do the pre-weakening and to weld the blast plates on. But because the site is so open, the cranes are extremely susceptible to freak gusts of wind. When we're doing steel work, um, there may sometimes be a problem with wind speed. Um, so we've, be, we've got the weather forecast for this week and it's looking quite good so we can carry on with our pre-weakening work. Um, we're looking at wind speeds today of three miles an hour, which is nothing. Um, although it is going to pick up a bit towards the end of the week, we're not looking at anything major at the moment. If the winds reach a critical gale force speed, it will send the weakened cranes toppling down without the aid of explosives. Much cheaper than a controlled blowdown, but potentially fatal. And just in case you thought it was unlikely, take a look at this. Last time winds reached gale force on the Mersey. There used to be four cranes on site, 
But this one was blown over in freak weather conditions, and it wasn't even weakened. It's not just the wind that's a cause for concern. The deadline for the blowdown is 11 a.m. on Sunday. By now, every crane should have had its midsection removed, but the team have only finished one crane. That leaves two more to go, but only four days to do them. We're a bit behind on this job, and we're going to have to work a lot of hours and do a lot of hard work to get it back. Evening turns to night, and it's all quiet on Merseyside. Day two, Holly and Phil are still battling hard to maintain momentum. But it's almost as if the cranes are putting up one last stand. Halfway through the day, and controls demolition call in the heavy artillery. In the shape of explosives engineer, Mick Williams. They're trying everything they can to claw back lost time but it's not working. It's been a hectic day today. Um, apart from the weather, it's been probably the worst day that could possibly happen. The weather's kept up for us, but it's took us three times as long to do the prep work than we thought it would. Um, we've come across a few complications with bracings to remove that had full, fully welded plates behind that we had to get off. That's took a long time. And it's just physically taking longer than we expected to. So we are behind slightly now. We should have charged some um, we should have had one of the cranes fully charged today. We won't get any explosives on at all now until tomorrow. And with the battle to get the cranes ready continuing, the only blowdowns they'll see is in their dreams. This is the dream. But the reality of a steel blowdown means it's one of the most dangerous in the business. Anytime explosives are added to metal, it can lead to blast shrapnel every explosives engineer's worst nightmare. If things go wrong, the blowdown will propel large shards of steel towards these buildings. Each one is only meters away from the cranes. Blast shrapnel is extremely difficult to prevent and control. And what's more, it travels as fast as a jumbo jet. So the risks for buildings and anyone caught in the line of fire are high. But even when the cranes come down, they're still a cause for concern. Despite the time each crane has been out of use, they all still contain large amounts of oil. When the cranes hit the drop zone, it's possible the oil could spill with the real prospect it could end up in the River Mersey, creating an extreme environmental hazard. The only way to stop it is by creating a bank that should hopefully contain any spillage when the cranes hit the deck. Mick, Holly and Phil are well and truly on the ropes. There's absolutely nothing to look forward to as the work goes on and on and on. At least with nightfall, nothing else can go wrong. Good evening. We're straight away. Word of warning. We are expecting some pretty heavy rainfall tonight. The wind's the main thing tomorrow. Gale force winds. Gale force winds. Gale force winds expected there in the northwest and down the Irish Sea. So be warned about these. Oh dear. Coming up in part two, the wind takes its toll and Mick looks like he's about to throw in the towel. I'm a bit worried that uh, we're going to be a no-go. The morning of day three. The last few days have seen controlled demolition fighting to keep on top of the demanding schedule as they prepare for the demolition of three cranes at the Camel Laird shipyard in Liverpool. By now, the cranes should be cut. The explosive should be on. And the connections should be made. But it's not going to plan. Now there's just 48 hours to go till a blowdown, and the team's stress levels are rising. But so too is the wind speed. An ill wind is blowing across the Mersey. If it becomes too high, everything will come to a complete standstill. And the forecast for the week earlier on in the week was going to be good weather all week, but it's getting pretty miserable, as you can see. 
and we've heard a forecast of high winds coming this afternoon. Just see what the, uh, the future brings for us tomorrow and see what the, the wind speeds are going to be this afternoon. Despite the wind, the team seem to be making some headway. They're attaching the first of the many explosives that will blow the cranes. And because it's a steel job, it will take more than one explosive to make it work. We're using a combination of two different types of explosives. This is the first one, this is Gelomex, which is a nitroglycerin-based explosives for the kicking charges. We strap these together to make a bomb, so to speak, and that's strapped onto the leg, which actually pushes the leg out once the cutting charges have cut through the steel. This explosive here is called what's known as blade. Um, it literally cuts through steel. It's just black foam. Inside there, the green is the explosives and the, um, the orange is soft copper, which forms a jet, which forces all the pressure out into one area, which makes a clean cut through steel. They're using 15 kilos of blade, the shaped cutting charge, and 18 kilos of jelly mix. The blade will chop through the supporting legs here, and the jelly mix will provide the kick to push the supporting legs away from the cranes. If they ever get it finished, of course. There's tension building on site, and Holly's world's about to fall apart. Okay. Look, ring me, Emma, please, as soon as you know. We've got one and a half days left and a hell of a lot of work to do. And my sister's just rung me and she's actually gone into labour. So I'm a bit concerned about that at the moment. But obviously I'm going to have to stick around and get this done because we've got a deadline to meet. A few hours later, Holly leaves the site to be at her sister's bedside. The labour pains are well and truly growing on both fronts. Mick and Phil are still up against it. Even though they've finally finished attaching the explosives to one crane, there's still two left. Two cranes in two days looks like too much. I'm a bit worried that uh, we're going to be a no-go for Sunday. As Mick contemplates failure, across the Mersey, things are also subdued. Between them, ex-employees Eddie Makin and Bill Suckley spent almost a hundred years working in the shipyard. Your name is We Built It. It's sad because there's nothing left for the young people that's coming up behind us. I've got children of my own who are growing up now. They've got children. They'll never see anything like that. It'll be just the same as watching the last boat that we did in 1993 going out, out of that gate over there and saying, that's the end. Meanwhile, Mick and Phil are still carrying on the fight, but with no Holly, it's even more of an uphill struggle. The arrival of darkness sees them concede defeat. Well, it looks like we're going to have to finish on Sunday morning, come in really early Sunday, and finish off the charging and connecting on the third one then. But, um, just hope the weather's all right tomorrow. Day four, crisis time. The gloves are off, and the team have had to draft in yet another pair of hands. Dick Green has joined them, so now there are four explosives engineers on site. After leaving the job yesterday to rush to her pregnant sister's bedside, Holly has returned. It was a false alarm, but the birth could happen at any moment. The struggle to meet the deadline sees the team picking up a real head of steam. The extra effort has seen the team finish two of the three cranes. Problem is, there's still one crane left and tomorrow is blowdown day. Six o'clock, it's D-Day. The team have five hours left to hit the deadline, but they are still working on the final crane.
One thing that's finally going the team's way is the wind. It's relented. But the pressure on Holly hasn't. My sister's been in labour for two days, so I'm a bit worried about her. And still nothing's happening, so I've just spoken to the hospital and apparently it's, it's all systems go now. So hopefully I'm going to get back in time to see her. Even though the team is still working, other preparations carry on. There's a 200 metre exclusion zone around the cranes, but because they are visible from major roadways, the highways agency and police will have to slow traffic moments before the blowdown. Time's running out. Eddie Makin and Bill Suckley are here to pay their last respects. Meanwhile, Mick and Holly are finally down from the cranes. It looks like they've got something to smile about. We're on schedule now. We've got a couple of hours to go and probably only about half an hour's work left now. We've just got the final connections to do now. They've made it. All the explosives are connected up. So too are all the cranes. Around the site, the anticipation's building. It's going to be one hell of a bang, this. At least the cloud's lifted now a bit, so... I'll let, the, let it disperse, yeah. It'll be a hell of a three bang. Five minutes to go. Everybody's out now, so it should be all right. Been quite a stressful morning, generally. <laughs> but then there's a moment of madness. He's coming out. Six people are risking life and limb by walking through the exclusion area. Oh, come on! Five minutes! Give that radio. Phil, give that radio. People coming out of the building here. Come in, sentry number four. Number four, there is a few people coming through the warehouse. I believe you're the one in the middle behind it. Nobody, and repeat, nobody is allowed to enter that building. Does he just let them through? No, it's probably, they've probably gone in before. Mate, we've got five minutes to blow down. Can you get outside the zone? Yeah, the other side. Yeah, right, the other side of the fence, mate. Is there anybody else in that building? People no. coming all up. We've got an in. They didn't send anybody through here. I'm going to go in, mate. Tell him he lets nobody through. Nobody. It's miles out to the other side of the building. Right out, mate. You have to walk around the fence and go right out. If they'd walked out five minutes later, they could have been killed. A plunge with everything. Everything sound, Dick. Well, they're my structure. That's a non-L shot firing device. No good without the key, so I'll just keep the key out for now. That's ready to go. Two rockets, that's well, one made to maroon. Thirty seconds left. Every move and every angle has been covered. But this was a rush job. After all the problems, can they really be sure it will work? Stand by for the countdown. 10. 9. 8. 7. 6.
Let's go, let's go. Jesus Stay in your Christ. position. Stay in your position. Right. Nice one, Phil. Nice one, Phil. <laughs> well done, Ollie. But for Bill Suckley and Eddie Makin, it's a bitter moment. The lifetime gone in two seconds. We're finished. You won't see them here again. Definite skyline. As Eddie and Bill look on, the team are already heading towards the wreckage to inspect the demolition. Inside the mangled steel, Engineer Phil Lowe is looking at the remains. He's facing this way now. If you, if you remember, we kicked them out that way. So what, actually what the column's done, it's turned over and ended up the other way. If you look round the other side and see where it's cut with an explosive cutting charge, it's precise, it's cut it like a knife. Well, like a guillotine, isn't it, that one? Cameras inside the exclusion provide an incredible view of the blowdown. The sequence went like clockwork. The far crane going first, closely followed by the other two. And all the explosives went off as planned to allow a precise and clinical blowdown. All that's left is piles of twisted metal. The job went well. well the blowdown's brilliant, fantastic, spectacular, I think, for everybody to see. Um, bit of a noise. A loud crack, I think, uh, made a few people wake up this morning, the echo across the thing, but uh, no, it's a brilliant job. With the job completed, it's time for the team to ship out. Some, however, are not on their way home, but to hospital. Holly's sister's baby is finally on its way. Is it all right if I go? Baby's coming. Cheers, bye! Bye! Hours later, she became the proud auntie to baby George. What a demolition. It's taken five days. Four explosives engineers. People coming out of the building here. One near miss. And three massive detonations to get the job done. Let's go, let's go! 